So here we are. We are here to talk about teacher evaluation and to help to share with you some of what we've learned in both the research and in many years of practice, actually, around teacher evaluation. So what I'd like to do is just begin with a minute, let's, here we get. With, with just back up a little bit, and I'll just reiterate something that Audrey said just a moment ago about why are we even doing this, other than that there's a law, right? And you could say, well, okay, why is there a law? And it has, first of all, to do with quality assurance. That, you know, we're public schools. We take public money. The public has a right to expect a good teaching, period. That's, there's almost nothing more to say about it than that. Um, I mean, you could actually argue that it's, it's even more the case in private schools, that it is they take people's money directly. Right? It doesn't even go through the tax system. But the principle is the same. It's other people's money to do arguably the most important work there is, which is to educate the children. And so we hold that, we hold that in trust, and it's a, it's a duty to spend it well. But the second reason, which Audrey also mentioned, for doing this is to promote professional learning. And that I don't say that because I think that teaching is of poor quality and has to be fixed. That's not it at all, actually. It's that teaching is so hard that it's never perfect. It's enormously complex work. And so it's part of the obligation of every teacher as every professional to be engaged in a career-long quest to improve their practice. It's just, it's, it's not an add-on to the job, it's integral to the job of teaching. Now, these two aims of, of uh, quality assurance and professional learning, they actually are rather different kinds of things. I mean, a, a system that ensures quality has to be rigorous and robust and defensible and reliable and valid and a lot of hard-sounding things. Whereas a system to promote learning is likely to be more collegial, more collaborative, sort of softer. And so how do we combine them? And in my view, the way we combine them is through the design of the system itself. And now, I don't have to remind anybody in this room that of these two purposes of teacher evaluation, the public, and therefore school boards, and therefore legislators, care only about the first. And I'll be honest with you, actually, as a parent, I care only about the first. I'm really not interested to know that a certain teacher will be good next year. Right? My kid's in there now. I mean, it's got to be good, or at least got good enough. So that's what it becomes the heart of it. How good is good enough, and good enough at what, and how do we know, and who should decide? The big ideas are actually pretty simple. The doing of it is not all that simple, but the big ideas are fairly simple. So. Okay, so that's what we're about, is because, let's not forget one other thing, there are many factors that influence student learning. The most, the single most important one that happens in the school is the quality of teaching. And so therefore, it is everybody's obligation to do what they can to improve that. Now, there are other, there are other factors as well, even inside the school, right? The quality of the curriculum, the access to resources, and so on. But the quality of teaching is the single most important one, and therefore we would be delinquent if we didn't put good energy and, and focus on always helping teaching improve, particularly given its complexity. So let's just review for a second here how this landscape has changed over the last couple of years. The first influence being the widget effect, which I'll talk more about in a second. That was a report by the New Teacher Center uh, the New Teacher Project, excuse me, in I think May of 2009, which has had enormous impact, especially on the Race to the Top competition, which itself influenced the uh, state legislation, which everybody's living under right now. Um, so let me just say a quick word about the widget effect report, which you may not be aware of. The, it, it's also known as the Lake Wobegon report, um, because the size of those circles represent the numbers and therefore the percentages of teachers whose performance was judged to be at these different levels. One of them was Chicago, one at Akron. There were some other districts in the study, but these are just the ones we pulled out for to illustrate. And the size of the circles, you can see, the vast majority of them are at the top of whatever the scale is, outstanding or superior, whatever it's called. 
the next one down, very good or excellent, next one satisfied, down to vanishingly small, in some cases literally zero at the unsatisfactory level. Now this would be good news, right? I mean, we, I mean it sh ought to be good news. We'd say all of our teachers are so fabulous, but for one fact, that the children in these same places aren't learning the way we'd want them to. So there is something wrong with this picture, and it's certainly not working for children. But in a way, it's even worse, actually, in this way. If we look at Los Angeles, now that big circle is all the teachers in Los Angeles. The blue part of the circle, which is almost all of it, are the teachers whose performance was judged to be satisfactory or above. The little tiny yellow sliver are the unsatisfactory rated teachers, and of them, you see the little, they pulled it out here and there's a circle on the right and it's red and sort of green chartreuse -y. The chartreuse part of that circle, which is not quite but almost half, of the teachers who's, who were themselves judged to be unsatisfactory, their students outperformed all the students of the teachers in the blue. So, I mean, <laughs> Think about that for a minute. I mean, you know, we can't even get it right at that level. I mean, I tell you what, there's, there's actually a little bit of good news in all this, and that is, it's a low bar. We can do better. It shouldn't take much to do better. So what would better be? Well, in any evaluation system, you can consider two dimensions. One has to do with rigor, and the other has to do with the level of stakes. Rigor has to do with, are their standards of practice clear? Are the assessors trained? Are the procedures matched to the outcomes and so on? That is, is it a rigorous system? The level of stakes, obviously, refers to the consequences of a negative decision, personnel decisions. So, like, is anybody going to be sanctioned or denied tenure or fired or something? Um, and so, when you have two dimensions, of course, you've got four quadrants, and we can fill in the quadrants so, uh, with some examples, is all they are. In the high stakes and high rigor quadrant on the upper right, there are a couple of examples there. One is national board certification. That is a very rigorous process, as many of you may know if, if you've gone through it. Um, and it's high stakes in the sense that, uh, in some places at least, uh, teachers get a bonus or a recognition or something, but it's only high stakes in the positive direction. Nothing bad ever happens to you if you fail, right, or don't pass. Unlike Praxis 3, which was, is, but almost in the past tense now, because it's only used, I think, now in Arkansas, that is, was, a, a observation process for teachers in their first year of teaching to either grant or deny a continuing license very high stakes. I mean, if you failed it, you didn't get a license, right? Um, and very rigorous. Training for the assessors, they had to pass a test in order to be an assessor. And by the way, national board assessors have to as well. So it's rigorous training and so on. So it, that makes it rigorous and also high stakes. Uh, now, there are some examples of low stakes but high rigor. Not very many, but the new teacher centers in Santa Cruz, the, the mentoring program they, they offer is an example of that. There are tons of low stakes, low rigor, informal mentoring programs, and traditional evaluation systems. Not rigorous, but it never mattered in the past. It does matter now. And so, as you can see on this slide, the ones I truly worry about are the high stakes and low rigor. That's danger. I think, because, I mean, all I can think is that it's going to be full employment for lawyers. I mean, think about it, right? Just think about it a moment. It, I, I mean, I hope we avoid that, honestly, but I can't imagine this will not result in litigation if we don't do this work well. So um, and the very next thing I want to get to is what constitutes doing it well. And let me just throw one other idea, though, in, out in front of you, and that is that there are two basic approaches for defining effective teaching and therefore assessing it. One has to do with describing and then assessing teacher practices. My framework for teaching is in that category. It's in that box, if you like. That is, it describes what teachers do, okay? 
The other major approach, well, I'll only say a few words about, is the results that teachers get with their students. Now, I can't imagine, I have never met a teacher or a union activist, actually, who thinks that the second is irrelevant. Of course it's relevant. The challenge is to figure out what counts as evidence and how that evidence can be attributed to an individual teacher. That's the challenge. And it's very hard. I mean, people are, there are smart people, thank heavens, around the country working on this, trying to figure it out. I don't think they've finished. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, it's really hard. Let me just give you a tiny example. Let's say I teach fourth grade. And my reading scores of my students show good gains. And so I'm happy, my principal's happy, everybody's happy, except for one thing. There's also a reading specialist in the building. It's impossible to know which of us actually was responsible for those kids' gains. And by the way, it might have been last year's teacher anyway. <laughs> I mean, no kidding, right? And there's no, there's no psychometrics formula that can sort that. And so we're, I think everybody's doing the best they can, trying to figure out good measures for this, but it's, it's not easy. It's just not easy. So I'm leaving it to the experts and I'm sticking with the only thing I know how to do, which is to describe good teaching and what we, what we know about it. So what do we know then about a system for teacher evaluation? Well, first of all, it has to have a clear definition of teaching, like what is good teaching. And I, I just must take about, I think, 40 seconds and tell you a really brief anecdote. When I was first teaching, uh, it was, a, I think, a fifth grade class. I taught science to elementary kids. and. So it was, I think, a fifth grade class. I was introducing a new unit on buoyancy and density. Wonderful topic for fifth graders. And, you know, related to thinking and floating, of course, but more advanced. And the kids had pushed their desks together and made tables. And on each table, we had a tub of water, sort of like a dishpan. And, now I don't need to tell you, I was never the most popular teacher with the custodial staff, but never mind. Um, in the event, this day was fine. The kids, each, each of them had a lump of clay which they had weighed. We had a little pan balance in the room. When they had weighed them, they were satisfied they had basically the same amount, the same mass. They put them in the water, and of course they sank immediately. Their challenge was to make this clay float, which they discovered they could do if they fashioned it into a sort of a boat shape. Well, they, that, was, that was exciting, but then they immediately went to the next challenge, which was, can I make a good boat? And they defined good as one that would hold a lot of cargo in the form of paper clips. That's what we had. So they were exploring questions like, should it have thin sides or thick sides? The end gives you more volume, right, for, for the amount of material. Should it be shaped more like a bowl or more like a canoe? Bowl, same reason. Canoes are for rapids. Okay, so they were drawing pictures on the board of their designs and how many paper clips they held. So here's 11, here's 18, here's 27, here, and so on. They got up over 50. They were making boats with paper thin walls, even top so the water wouldn't come rushing in. Now, remember, this was the first day of this. In subsequent days, we got into more typical uh, displacement, or buoyancy topics like displacement. If you remember Archimedes and the Eureka, Eureka moment, that's what we're talking about here, right? So anyway, in the middle of all this, the principal came to the door to do an observation. He took one look at this scene, he pulled me aside, and he said, I'll come back when you're teaching. We clearly didn't agree on what was good teaching. Well, we evidently didn't agree on what was teaching, actually. All I knew from that comment was whatever he thought it was, it wasn't this. <laughs> and, but here's the, really the reason I'm telling you, I never knew. I never did know. And shockingly, we're not very far from that world yet today. There are plenty of teachers and administrators when they come across my framework or whatever's been adopted, they say, well, at least I know what they're looking for. Or at least I know what I should be looking for if I'm the observer. And so just having clarity on what is good teaching is absolutely the first step. But then we're not quite done because we need instruments and procedures that provide evidence of the teaching. That is, how do teachers demonstrate their skill? almost always through classroom observation, of course, that's the quintessential work of teaching, but other things as well, artifacts, planning documents, uh, records of how you communicate with families, etc. all the other stuff that goes along with, because there's a lot of behind the scenes work in teaching, right? We need trained evaluators who can make consistent 
accurate, accurate and consistent judgments. Already, already uh, uh, mentioned this, and I would only pause here long enough to say, no kidding. No kidding. This, after having clear definition of teaching, is the linchpin of a defensible system. The absolute, it's, it should never matter to a teacher, where, or it should never be easier or hard, excuse me, harder to get tenure, let's say, in one, dis, in one school than another within a district. Or it shouldn't matter which of two evaluators comes to observe you. The result should be the same. If any three of us were trained and certified, we should watch the same lesson and agree. It's just, it's just a no-brainer. And yet, we've not done that ever up to now. We've never done that. And we discovered in a study that, sh um, that Sarah will describe to you how we learned how to do it, and we also, in an additional study, the MET project through the uh, Gates Foundation required us to get good at, at training and certifying assessors and then you need professional development for teachers, obviously, for them to know what, I mean, so they're not in the position that I was with, like, not knowing what somebody's looking for, right? I should know. That's, this is assessment 101. You never evaluate people on something they don't know what it is. It's just, it's just, you know, just fundamental, um, fundamental principle. And then, of course, you need some formulas to roll up the, um, the scores into an overall score. Um, because you, there's a lot of data points, you know, and you, have to, and you have to be able to do that. So, let me remind you then of what we're talking about, that any system of teacher evaluation has to reflect the complexity of teaching itself. That is, that's why a checklist is so inadequate, because it doesn't reflect, it doesn't mirror what the hard work of teaching is. This complexity of teaching, I need to just read this with you. This is a, a quote from Lee Shulman, where he said, after 30 years of doing such work, I've concluded that classroom teaching is perhaps the most complex, most challenging, and most demanding, subtle, nuanced, and frightening, don't you love that word, <laughs> our species has ever invented. The only time a physician could possibly encounter a situation of comparable complexity would be in the emergency room of a hospital during or after a natural disaster. <laughs> I mean, it's really quite amusing, and, uh, and it's almost certainly right. I mean, if, think for a moment about the work that doctors do. It is complex. But let me remind you of something. They see their patients one at a time. We would call that tutoring. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, the minute you add a second student, or a fifth, or a 28th, the complexity increases not just arithmetically, but exponentially, in terms of all the interactions, the what's going on in the classroom. So, any framework for teaching, any description of teaching, has got to reflect this complexity. So my framework, and I'll, I'm not gonna spend long here because I hope you know this, <laughs> um, uh, has these four big domains. Each of them is, has got some components in it, these five or six each, and, um, and they, the domains two and three are what happened in the classroom. Domains one and four are what we would call behind the scenes work. Let me just say a couple of things about this, not very many. Um, it's, it's grounded in some assumptions about teaching and learning, by the way. The assumptions about teaching are that teaching is not only demanding physical work. People, you're tired at the end of the day when you teach, right? And it's demanding emotional work and I'm pretty sure the more caring a person is, the more demanding. But it's also challenging intellectual work. Teachers make hundreds, literally, people have counted this, hundreds of decisions a day, often under what you'd have to call unfavorable circumstances, like in a hurry, right? And so it's, it, in other words, teaching is a thinking person's job. Now this has enormous implications for anybody who supports teaching teachers, mentors, coaches, principals, supervisors. That is, if we honestly do accept, and I think we have to, that teaching is cognitive work, then the conversations we have about teaching must be about the cognition. They have to be about the thinking. It's not just a matter of did you do this or that. It's a question of, of how and why and have you ever tried it differently and et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's about the, that's why the conversations are so valuable. 
because they, and, and let me just also say that, that the way I think about teacher evaluation then reflects this. And let's just think for a second about how uh, observations and evaluations have been done in the past, and in many ways still, still are today. Let's say I'm the teacher and you're the principal, right? You come to my class, you watch me teach, you take notes, you go away, you write up your notes, you come back, and you tell me about my teaching. Now, who's doing the work? What am I doing? Nothing. Well, I'm teaching my class. I'm actually under contract to do that. But for this process, oh, and by the way, it's get, it gets worse. Now we're in your office and we're talking about this lesson. I know from the standpoint of that conversation, all I have to do is endure it. You will eventually stop talking and I can leave. <laughs> So, I mean, should we be surprised that teachers don't actually learn much? No, well, no, because let me remind you of something that we do know about learning, whether it's adults or children. Now, cognitive psychologists do not agree on everything, but they do agree on this. And it's so obvious, I even, it, I, it's even sort of embarrassing to say it, but here's, what, here's the bottom line. Learning is done by the learner <laughs> through an active intellectual process. So if you, the principal, are doing all the work and I'm completely passive, of course I'm not going to learn from that. Which is why then any observation process has to involve the teacher in an active role if we want to promote learning. And we have to want to promote learning because otherwise nobody will get, I mean, if all we've done three years from now is gotten better at judging teachers, and, and haven't helped anybody get better, people are gonna wonder what on earth did we spend all that money for? And I, I really am a little bit nervous about that. Fortunately, we know how to promote teacher learning it's, 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 and teachers are eager for it themselves and they're good at it. It's not, that's not the issue, but it's setting up the systems that will allow it to flourish. So let me just say a couple words here and then I'll let Sarah tell you her wonderful uh, research <laughs> results. The framework for teaching, let me say a couple things here about it. Um, not only is it grounded in those assumptions, but it also, I would not want you to think that I think that because these aspects of teaching are listed separately and they're described separately, I wouldn't want anybody to think that I think that teachers do them separately. I know better than that, it's all very intertwined. And by the way, an interesting way to illustrate that is to pick any one. Like, for example, questioning and discussion techniques. And ask yourself, if a teacher were really good at that, what else would that same teacher have to be good at also in order to be good at that? They'd have to know their content, right? To, they'd have to know their students. What's an appropriately challenging question? They'd have to have clear outcomes. What do I want kids to learn from this discussion? They'd have to have some things over in domain two about a safe environment to take risks. And, do you raise your hands or do you not? And so I'm sure you get the idea. So then you might say, well, why do we list them out separately then if it's all so entangled? And I'd like to offer you an analogy of a theater and the round. Think of a theater and the round, right? You've got the play in the middle. Now think of the play, the lesson like the play. Now this is a theater and the round. So the audience is sitting all around. Because the audience is sitting all around, the lights have to come from all directions. I think of these things like the lights. Here's a lesson, but let's just focus on the interactions, on the procedures, on the questioning. And when you think of it that way, this framework then becomes an analytic tool. And in a sense, that's all it is. It's an analytic tool to understand teaching. And in that way, it's useful for anybody who's wanting to understand and improve practice. So I'll say one more thing here. The, sometimes people look at these, and they say, well, it's okay, but you know, it's missing some things. What about technology? That's gone missing. What about high expectations? Well, those are aspects of teaching that I called common themes. These are not listed as components of teaching, not because they're not important, they are, but because they, well, the, the components describe the work of teaching. They describe what teachers do. The common themes describe the manner in which they do the work of teaching. So a teacher who holds high expectations for student learning will have outcomes set at a high level, will ask questions at a, at a challenging level, will give feedback to students on the assumption of high level learning as they will communicate with families. That is, the common themes, all of them, 
infuse the framework, the components of the framework. And an interesting question to ask and, and to discussion to have is which ones of the common themes apply to which ones of the components and how? For example, for which of these components would the use of technology enhance it? Not all, but a lot of them. And in what way? So, and, and you can do the same thing with all the others. And then my last point is just that for each of the components of the framework, there is what we call a rubric, levels of performance, that describes in English, fairly straightforward English, what it looks like at different levels of performance. And let me just say that over the course of the last few years, as a consequence of being involved in a couple of these large research studies, I discovered, to my chagrin, I will say, that the language in the rubrics was not tight enough to train for. And we'll talk more about this later, but I had to both tighten the language and add some, some tools to help observers and, and, um, and assessors of any kind to, to, to be able to uh, look at performance and assess it accurately. So we added critical attributes and some possible examples for each level of performance for each of the components, and we'll describe more about that later. But that's, in a nutshell, is the framework for teaching and some of the background to it. And I'm gonna invite Sarah to come and tell you about her exciting research, and I thank you so much for letting me be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.